it is treatment. We're still working on it. So the treatment uh, will help us prevent further spread and the tracing also can prevent a further spread. And of course, testing will identify people who are dangerous and who are not dangerous. So that is the COVID-19 containment plan, which has been working pretty good, except in many countries that was missed in the beginning. Next, let's look at the COVID-19 testing scenario. So the most common testing method is RT-PCR or real-time PCR, which is real-time reverse transcriptase PCR, which, uh, which sometimes is confused with reverse transcriptase PCR, which is not RT-PCR. So this works by taking a swab from throat or nasal swab method. And uh, there was a news uh, about like a month or month and a half ago from Abbott Laboratories. They actually found out something called ID Now, and they said about five minutes for positive results. But unfortunately, we haven't seen any more updates on that particular machine. So it remains today that it takes about three days to find out whether you're positive, excuse me. So the method is standard PCR. And the other method, which has given a little bit of success and not a lot of success, I heard from whatever I read, it's rapid test, which is through blood. The other one is through uh, nasal and throat swab, which is uh, you will collect cells from uh, nasal and throat areas, and then you will collect the RNA from there, and then convert that RNA into cDNA by reverse transcriptase, uh, enzyme reverse transcription reaction, and then you will end up doing a standard PCR through real-time PCR. And uh, through this blood test, which is rapid test, they say it's about 10 minutes, but I think I read in India as well, this antibody testing wasn't that successful. So what they test here is if you or I or anyone has been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 or any virus, we will have developed antibodies in most cases. And those antibodies are a signal to you that, okay, you are affected or you are exposed to the virus, and then you might get affected in the, in the near uh, future. So that's gonna help us uh, find out whether we are affected or not to the antibody. I hope it is uh, gonna be refined and then we're gonna get a good test. So the other popular test is saliva. So SARS-CoV-2 in saliva will be tested again through RNA-based methods, uh, ending up uh, in real-time PCR. So I just heard from one of my colleagues yesterday that uh, she's a doctor. So she's talking about uh, the test is about 90%. And unfortunately, the accuracy of the uh, end, but the sad thing is that we were just discussing that why not people find out uh, the uh, like data and then present it in a paper and then publish. Uh, I will just uh, let you guys know that, okay, SARS-CoV-2 saliva test seems like a very uh, good test about giving about 90% accuracy. So I, I did find out something called pathodetect, which is again a PCR-based test. And I was, uh, like I read on uh, Indian media that it is actually uh, a person and then I don't see further uh, any update on that. Please let me know. And I hope that also works out and that PCR will in identifying a lot of people. Let's go to the uh, projected timeline that was uh, published in magazine. So I was pan out. It's going to be like antibodies and vaccines. So we Repurposing drugs drugs for many, many diseases uh, out of those, uh, the famous example, uh, kind of a bad example would be hydroxychloroquine, which is a malarial drug, and uh, right to nowhere, liponovir, for, which are being repurposed efficacy. So liponovir, right to to some extent, and there are many more who are being tested. So that will be the first strategy to find a cure or, uh, you know, relief for COVID-19. So the next strategy is going to be antibodies. So what are the projected timeline? So for repurposing drugs, they said about by end of April, we would have gotten a repurposed drugs, which were awesome for um, COVID-19. Unfortunately, we are in June. Uh, June is about to end. So we haven't gotten that yet. But there is some uh, very good improvement and we have got some good drugs, but it's not the final one, unfortunately. 
And what about the second stage? For antibodies, uh, we're going to get antibodies from people who are affected and recovered. So that actually is projected to work out by December. So by December, end of December 2020, we should have gotten a very good, uh, like, you know, bunch of uh, antibody treatments that work uh, that work well for COVID-19 by saving lives and giving us peace of mind. And the next one is vaccines, which is uh, projected, unfortunately, to go to uh, September. Actually, the case, because uh, like the common public is not aware of the whole vaccine production strategy, which takes about 18 months. Uh, it, it is anywhere from 12 to 18 months. So if it is early, we have some drug, like vaccines are in actually are going to be in phase three clinical trial. That will be in July, uh, one of them. Uh, so if, if it all works out, we might, we might, uh, uh, mind you, we might actually get uh, some of the vaccines or one of the vaccines in January or February 2021. Let's hope really for that. All right, so what are the treatments available? So on the right, it's actually the three strategies we just discussed. So like I discussed, Ebola, HIV, and malaria are the forefront uh, diseases, but malaria looks like not a better choice. And you take those drugs and then you treat people and then find out whether they are working good. If they're working good, you're going to treat more people and you're going to finalize that some of them or one of them is going to work. And for these drugs, uh, there is something called a trial called Solidarity that is run by WHO. And I think anybody from across the globe can uh, like uh, recruit themselves by their doctors into those trials. And then they can get tested with uh, many other drugs, like about four of them are being considered for testing right now. So that is one big trial that is going on for uh, repurposed drugs. The next is antibodies, which is still in the works. So you actually find a record patient or you produce these antibodies in animals or you bioengineer these antibodies and then you go for mass production and then you go for injection into the people. The one problem with antibodies is that it's just not antibodies mostly. Uh, it is other components as well, unless it is purified to become antibodies. So we should keep in mind that it can be antibody with other uh, components of the blood and plasma, or it can be just the antibodies. So if it is just the antibodies, the toxicity might be less and the cure and the accuracy of treatment might be high. But if it is antibodies with other components of the blood, it could cause more toxicity. But when it becomes the prime goal is to save patient lives, it is best, so antibodies. So the next thing is vaccines. So vaccine, we actually will give uh, a component of the vax, like the virus, and then we uh, give it to uh, animals and then produce the vaccines, and uh, that becomes produced in uh, humans, and then that's how it works to prevent the disease. So let's look at, on the left, the famous drugs that have been uh, in the works since about March to April. So Paletra is one of the famous drugs, which is a combinatorial drug for HIV, which is lipanover and ritanover. What does it attract, like attack, which is it prevents viral reproduction. So the next one is remdesivir. That was actually in the news recently for giving a lot of good benefits. So it has actually benefited MERS and SARS. And what does it do? It actually prevents, again, viral RNA replication. So if you prevent viral RNA replication, you're going to prevent the viral load, and then you're going to prevent further damage to many, many organs. So the next one is Losartan. We haven't seen much about this drug in the uh, recent news. So what it does is reduces blood pressure. And uh, the fourth one is Favipiravir, which, which was called Avigan, which was uh, a drug from Japan. And that's a common flu drug. And uh, luckily for us, it worked. Uh, really well in in a U.S. I mean U.K. trial. I'm sorry, U.K. trial. And then it found they found that rapid reduction of viral load was seen in many many patients. And in India recently, I found that they they are actually uh, gonna mass produce it for about 103 rupees for one tablet, and uh, they're gonna actually give it for people. And I hope this actually helps prevent a lot of 
deaths and a lot of serious illness like from COVID-19. Samra, I haven't seen much about this drug in the news lately, and that is actually immune suppressor, which prevents inflammation, which prevents immune reactions in the body. And ne next one is also an immune suppressor or inflammation suppressor, which is dexamethasone, which is also lately discussed a lot in the news. All right, so next, let's move on to other potential COVID-19 treatments. What are the other potential COVID-19 treatments? There are about clonal antibodies, which is again an antibody which is uh, specific uh, from one clone, they produce it, so it does not have clonal variation, so it is a monoclonal antibody. And these are the companies like Ver Biotechnology, Vuxi Biologic, Absarella, they're all testing antibodies collected from recovered patients all over the globe. And let's hope, so, let's seriously hope that that's gonna work out. And the next one is blood plasma transfer. That was really discussed a lot in the news. And then that works by, by collecting blood uh, from patients and then getting only the plasma and then testing that plasma by injecting it into the patients. So there are like big trials going on with thousands of patients. But the one danger everybody's uh, indicating is that there could be toxicity from this because of the other components in the plasma. Like I said before, it not, it's not just the antibodies which we need for attacking the SARS-CoV-2, but it is other actually many, many uh, components uh, which might become bad for a patient because it's coming from one patient to another. So let's keep that in mind. And it's not uh, like a cure yet. It is still being tested. So the other beautiful thing is that mesenchymal stem cells are being considered as one of the uh, possible treatments, which actually, when I checked, it was about like a couple of companies and the prominent one is something called Atherosis. So what it does is that uh, it actually prevents or help prevent something called acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS or ARDS. So what it does is actually this symptom symptom is caused by, or syndrome, sorry, is caused by COVID-19 severity. And uh, this is caused during the ICU uh, like admission of a patient, which is the most serious and later stage. So what it does is it actually prevents the oxygen, uh, like uh, it causes oxygen deprivation and prevents the patient from uh, uh, whatever, like respiratory uh, system uh, failure, which is like absence of oxygen and then the ability to, to breathe. So this actually is prevented by this mesenchymal stem cells. And the other thing is, uh, COVID-19 causes something called cytokine storm. So the cytokine storm is an enormous production of cytokines, and then those cytokines start attacking the host uh, cells and not the virus alone. So that way this uh, ARDS is caused, and then that causes oxygen deprivation, and that in turn causes the uh, ICU admission of patients, and patients die by lack of oxygen. And even after providing ventilator support, many patients unfortunately and sadly do die. So luckily this Mason Camel stem cells do prevent, have been shown to prevent in a very few patients for now, like 20 patients in China and about seven patients in the US have been tested and about like 75% of them have been recovered and then they've gone home. Unfortunately, these studies have not been published yet. So we still have to wait and see whether that is the truth. Next, let's look at the vaccine strategies. So the virus can be an uh, inactivated virus or weakened virus. The viral vector can be the vaccine, which is replicating type or non-replicating type. If you have replicating, it's a bit of a danger because it can replicate inside your body and cause some kind of a toxicity or unknown or off-target effects. If it's non-replicating, it's good because it's not going to become a lot in the body and then it's going to do its function of attacking the virus. The next thing could be, it could be just a nucleic acid. So traditionally the virus, like mostly is a protein like material, but off late people have started using both DNA and RNA as viral uh, vaccine candidates because these DNA can go produce RNA and then thereby produce protein and thereby produce the actual vaccine or the viral component. The RNA likewise can become whatever protein that it codes for, and that becomes 
the viral uh, candidate for the vaccine. And the famous one is protein-based, which is which could be one of the protein subunits of the SARS-CoV-2 or uh, like engineered things like virus-like particles, which is synthetic virus, which can become the vaccine candidate. So these are the different numbers that are actually in development. Uh, the virus uh, protein type is about 35. This was about like a month ago. I don't see a lot of uh, updates on this. I think it's being worked out. There are hundreds of candidates being considered and about like 130 of them being uh, like in the real works. So let's see uh, what are the vaccines in the pipeline. So this was an article that I published in uh, like Pudhiya Talemurai recently, that is about 7th of May uh, this year. So um, what are the viral vaccines that are actually in the near future, which are gonna be considered for people's use? So which is the first one is mRNA-1273, which is a company called Moderna from America. That has actually moved to clinical trial two. That was in phase one trial in May, but it moved to clinical trial two. And now, yesterday, whatever I saw was that uh, it is moving to phase three trial in July in many centers in the US and elsewhere. And the next one is ad 5 ncov and that is actually phase one or two right now. And LBSMENPDC. That is from a Chinese company, and I think that is still in phase one trial. And another one is pathogen-specific APC. So this will be some of the proteins. And the first one, the mRNA, is actually spike protein, which is S protein. The second one is also spike protein. And the third one, ino 4800 is also a spike protein. So majority of the uh, viral vaccines considered are spike proteins which are gonna code for spike proteins in the case of mRNA, and the rest are actually the spike proteins. And interestingly, which was uh, on the news recently was Chad Ox1, uh, and uh, it is now called as AZD1222, and that is one uh, uh, vaccine candidate from the Oxford University in England. So that is actually phase three trial, I heard. Phase three trial, I heard. And that is, again, a multi-center phase study. And there are many more. Sinovac from China, called Sinovac Biotech Company and Sinopharm, and Symbivo from Canada, RNA uh, vaccine from something called BioNTech. And I think this is also going to uh, phase uh, vaccine from Pfizer Germany, Pfizer America and BioNTech Germany. And I think they say we might get it in the end of the year, like by the end of the year. And there's something called CureVac from Germany, PetCovac. This is one of the interesting candidates of the vaccines because this is actually a patch, a skin patch. This can be actually wore on the skin, like a patch, like a Band-Aid. So what it has is actually a micro needle patch. So it has millions of micro needles and then those needles are gonna inject the vaccines into the skin and through the skin, they're gonna uh, get into the body and then they're gonna uh, in like elicit immune response. So this actually to me is very interesting because it is not pretty hard to give people and ask them you go ahead. They are like not worried about injections. They are not worried about taking it by mouth and not worried about this uh, like pit back to come to the forefront. And then this was actually from Pittsburgh University. That's why it is called uh, pit back. And this luckily and interestingly has been in the works, research work for about, I think about 10 years now. So they said it started about uh, like 10 years before they started working with the SARS virus and then MERS virus. And that's how they ended up with uh, COVID-19 testing and they are testing right now. So um, as I'm running out of time, I would like to just uh, pass through this other vaccines, you can just uh, look at online. There are many, many other vaccines in the pipeline. So we, we seriously hope many of them or one of them comes to fusion. All right, so what is the vaccine basics? So a virus, coronavirus, like we saw before, enters into the uh, host body and then enters into the cells through AC2 in the humans and then forms proteins and then they become viral assembly and then they become the actual virus. And then they go into the uh, bloodstream and then cause an immune response. So once it causes an immune response, 
T helper cells recognize them as viral peptide, and then they instruct the B cells to produce uh, anti-coronavirus antibody, and then uh, alongside parallelly, cytotoxic T cell are gonna destroy the infected uh, cells. Uh, hopefully that is what is working in many of the recovered patients, and let's hope that we get immunity, which is called herd immunity in people. So long-lived memory B and T cells are gonna recognize the virus for a long, longer time, like until the end of uh, persons like a lifetime, and then patrol in the body's uh, blood and lymph, and then they're gonna prevent and protect us from such dangerous viruses. I get a great uh, like herd immunity, which will actually rule out or remove the need for a vaccine or a drug, which can cause toxicity. All right, so next thing is, let's look at something called comorbidity. What is a comorbidity? So any disease that is associated with COVID-19 patients before the COVID-19 occurrence is called comorbidity. So the famous ones here are about 10 of them. So that is high blood pressure, heart diseases, irregular heartbeat or atrial fibrillation, kidney disease, bronchitis, stroke, dementia, and chronic liver disease. Uh, please look at many, many organs that are being affected by COVID-19 as well. So these comorbidity with the COVID-19 infection or the SARS-CoV-2 infection are gonna make it worse for these patients and then they're gonna cause a lot of death. So on the right, it is actually the deaths uh, from the COVID-19. That is about 86.2% of the New York uh, cases, which is about 5,489 COVID-19 deaths. So that is so sad because just because they have other comorbidity, they are being affected and killed by this dangerous COVID-19. So please keep in mind, whenever somebody has this, they have to be very, very careful compared to other people in the public to make themselves infection or from death by going to the doctor immediately and then getting treated. All right, so the famous uh, section that actually is being discussed a lot online is that COVID-19 myths. There are so many myths out of them, many, many are fake news. So there are so many rumors, there are so many questions. And I would like to give some scientific evidences that actually we have found on it. So let's move on. So the first interesting thing I found uh, is that microRNAs are found to be uh, like efficient in fighting against SARS-CoV-2, which is great. So microRNAs are micro, which is like tiny 20 nucleotide RNAs, which can control gene expression. And luckily for us, they can also latch onto the virus and then cut the viral RNA. That's what Dr. Sadanat Pulzele from Augusta University says. And I believe it because micro RNAs are coming to the forefront and they are being considered for many, many diseases, including the famous cancer. So let's see what it does with age. So with age and some chronic medical conditions, the attacking microRNAs unfortunately dwindle in number and that actually reduces our ability to respond to viruses. This is what Dr. Carlos M. Isolates from Co, like director of MCG Center for Healthy Aging in Canada says. All right, so what they did is they took RNA sequences both from SARS and SARS-CoV-2, about four samples of SARS and 29 samples of SARS-CoV-2 taken between January and April 2020 from five continents. That's actually interesting because we are including the variation racial differences and the 17 countries, including from the United States to Germany to Thailand. So what, is the, what are the results? They found about 848 microRNAs from the SARS genome and 873 microRNAs that target SARS-CoV-2, which is beautiful. And uh, one of them, which is MIR15B5P, has a high affinity for SARS-CoV-2, and SARS-CoV-2 attacking microRNAs had about 10 target sites, target sites in the SARS-CoV-2 genome, which is actually awesome because as many number of target sites as a microRNA has, so much potential it has to target that particular RNA and then uh, kill or destroy that RNA. And the only sad thing about this story is that as we age, the microRNA number goes down and that actually kind of explains why people with uh, like 
high age, like over 65, are getting affected by um, COVID-19 and also dying of the disease. So this is just a speculation. So it could be microRNA induced or caused uh, effect as well. All right, so let's quickly look at uh, the question, was SARS-CoV-2 engineered in a lab? So far, people have proved that it is not. So this one article from Nature Genetics is a proof that they looked at the spike protein, which is the reason why the virus enters into the human cells. They tried to compare it with bat, pangolin, and human SARS-CoV virus, and then bat SARS-CoV related viruses, which is many, and uh, more bat SARS-CoV-2 related viruses. And they found that they're all similar. They're all similar by about 70 plus percentage. So this means that this is not a new backbone that is created by some freak in a lab in anywhere in the world. And I found that Chinese, the Wuhan Institute of Virology created this virus, blah, 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 which is not true, at least from the data that we have so far. All right, so what, what do these people say? The authors of the study say that it is improbable that SARS-CoV-2 emerged through laboratory manipulation of a related SARS-CoV-like virus. And they also say that the genetic data irrefutably show that SARS-CoV-2 is not derived from any previously used viral backgrounds. So that brings up the question, so what exactly is the reason why that is spreading and then why we are getting it uh, like mutating and what, whatever that occurs with the SARS-CoV-2? They are giving two scenarios. One is natural selection in an animal host before zoonotic transfer and the second one is natural selection in humans following zoonotic transfer. Zoonotic transfer is transfer between animals. And natural selection is one of the uh, evolutionary principles, the main principle. So these uh, viruses get transferred between animals and they get selected for specific mutations or specific characteristic forms. the reason why they spread, the second reason spread between animals and of course between humans and humans. And uh, it is actually hard to prove or disprove right now, what, like where the origin of SARS-CoV-2 is from, but it is all tell us that, okay, these are conserved in the genome of the medicine, not nature genetics, origin of SARS-CoV-2. It's a beautiful article, please read it. All right, so the next famous question that I, will SARS-CoV-2 die in the summer? We don't know yet. So one of the studies that was done is from mocked up shells. They just created shells by synthetically producing the viral uh, version of SARS-CoV-2, and then they tried it to uh, treat with heat, humidity, and other environmental changes. And they found that this was a study from Utah University, and they found that uh, how the droplets evolved in temperature and humidity conditions. I think they kind of found preliminary that it does affect, like humidity does affect the viral uh, efficiency to live and then affect people. Infect people. So the next study was ultraviolet rays kill SARS-CoV-2, and they found it's interesting that they found that 21 to 24 degrees Celsius and about the virus for within 18 hours. That's the half life of the virus if subjected to 21 to 24 degrees Celsius and 20 percent humidity. So when humidity increased to 80 percent, interestingly, the viral half life decreased to six hours. Plus. If you add sunlight to that uh, combination, they found that the viral half-life was just two minutes. That's awesome. If it works, if it really works, the sunlight with the humidity and the uh, like ability to bring the virus to just two minutes of half-life will help us reduce the viral infection by 99% because it, it lives only for two minutes in the uh, environment. Let's hope this works. And they also tried to aerosolize the viral particle and then they tried and then they found that the virus 21 to 24 degrees Celsius at 20 percent humidity, it becomes 1.9, which which I will take it because uh, the environment has the viral in the aerosolized form. So you cannot compare the results to the actual scenario in the environment. So let's move on to the famous dexamethasone. So what is dexamethasone? It's a corticosteroid, a medicine that reduces inflammation by mimicking anti-inflammatory hormones produced by the body. How does it work? It works by dampening or like affecting the body's immune system and then reducing its activity. 
So who it can help, which is an important question. It can help only people that are hospitalized and receiving oxygen or medical ventilation, which just says that it is the most severely affected people. So keep that in mind. It cannot help other people who, which is uh, people with milder symptoms and people which do not have like a severe condition of COVID-19. So the reason is because suppressing the people like milder symptom people, immune system at this point will not do anything and will not be helpful. So why this can become an important thing in the future? Because the drug is part of the world's biggest trial from UK uh, testing existing treatments. Let's hope that the repurposing uh, method based drug. All right, next, let's look at some famous thing that came online like a month ago, I guess, what seen in the blood clot. So they found that about 20 to 30% uh, critically ill COVID-19 patients from Netherlands and France have been found to have clots in their body. So pneumonia clots, as they are called, affects the alveoli, which is the organ that like component that actually carries the oxygen to the blood. And plus in that alveoli, can form micro clots in the several regions, including the blood vessels, and then block blood flow, which can cause like a heart disease or heart attack. So why this clot occurs, nobody has a clue. They are studying, unfortunately. So the possible reasons the authors have cited is that are that uh, SARS-CoV-2 directly might attack the blood vessel lining because blood vessels have ACE2 receptor. So that way, uh, this virus can attack the endothelial and then des destroy it so that it can cause blood clots. Again, uh, COVID-19 mediated immune cell driven inflammation is one of the reasons why these blood clots happen. So the other reasons could be old age over diabetes. The solution, blood thinners. And uh, the bad news is that they carry risk. So it should be uh, noted that these uh, blood thinners can be bad for people with uh, associated conditions. So the doctors will uh, prefer, prefer this drug uh, versus like saving a patient or helping a patient. If it is saving, they will use it. If it's helping a patient, they will think about using it. So please keep that in mind. All right, so the other question I had was vitamin D. Can This is one of the famous uh, questions that was uh, circulated online. So I don't think it is going to help in an in enormous way because uh, vi vitamin D does help in preventing infections because it has something called catelicidins and defensins, which can lower viral replication rates. But we don't know yet whether that can help COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. So I think people are studying uh, the vitamin D in relation to SARS-CoV-2. So vitamin D can help in... Uh, like preventing the infection. So it might help against uh, uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 infection, but we don't know yet. So please do not go ahead and take a lot of vitamin D. Even if you wanna take about, uh, you have to take about 10,000 international units per day of vitamin D3, that is the recommended amount. So vitamin D, if you take it in this amount, is actually good for the body. So it helps in preventing other infections as well. So the idea that it's gonna help us. I think, I think a famous uh, Tamil saying is, uh, So the same deep people might just go on gulp, like so many engulf, so many uh, health threat treatments, unless a homeopathy doctors could prescribe, but I don't wanna believe it because- I mean, how can we say that in a immune which can protect him. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's not a joke. I mean, we don't get opportunities like this every day. So I really thank everybody, starting from your vice chancellor, including uh, you and all the participants for having uh, sitting so patiently listening to my talk. And again, I would like to insist that I am not a COVID researcher. So whatever I said, please take it with a pinch of salt, go back and then confirm all the findings. Whatever I say should not be taken as such. So please be aware and vigilant of whatever information you come across, across online, because we're all online today. So it's easy to mistake and miscommunicate information. So that's the only thing I would like to insist to the participants and the viewers that please be aware of all the fake news. 
just don't believe everything and especially whatever you said like the homeopathy and so many so many other uh, like uh, news are coming for personal interest and personal promotion people do several things so i would really like to ask uh, all the participants and all the people listening to this to be aware and be careful about what information you take home and then what information you share with your peers and friends and family so please be careful stay safe i would like to join you guys again with my own like research story if it's possible in the future it, it depends on dr piru and other people in the university thanks so much for the opportunity we we'll have you again some other point thank you hari uh, wonderful sure. and uh, everybody have a nice evening and see you all in the next sure. thank you bye bye guys yeah